Good morning, everyone. My name is Kira Lochran, and I'm the associate producer for the forum. Welcome. Uh, before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the original caretakers of this land, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe. For those of you who don't know, the forum is a series of uh, extensive ex a series of, of events that happen throughout our season that we hope share our work, uh, some of the ideas and themes of our playbill and our process with our audience. Today's event is being live streamed, so I'd like to welcome our, uh, our, our live stream audience. And um, uh, we're really excited about today's event, which is sure to be one of our highlights for this season, uh, Women Rising. We have with us three artists who are working in the season this year, uh, Hannah, Anushri, and Kate, who are uh, not only with us this season, but are are also at the vanguard of a new generation of Canadian playwrights, uh, uh, fantastic female playwrights, and that's what we're here to talk about. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Diane Marie Bridge, who's your moderator for today's event. Diane is our assistant forum producer and an artist in her own right. She was one of the original uh, members of the Michael Langham Workshop for Classical Direction here at the festival, and uh, has recently joined us for the, for the forum as an assistant producer. She's also worked at many other theater organizations, including the Guthrie in, in uh, Minnesota and uh, uh, City in Theatre in Toronto, and the Playwrights Guild of Canada, which is why I asked her to moderate today's event. <laughs> Diane. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Kira mentioned, I used to be the membership manager at uh, the Playwrights Guild of Canada probably over a decade ago. Um, and one of the things that I noticed was just the percentage of women who were actually part of the Playwrights Guild and how many people um, were produced and the imbalance in that. So I was very excited to be able to participate today and moderate this uh, panel. I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, so we have uh, Hannah Muscovich, who is a playwright, and this season she's um, here because she's written the play Bunny. So if you've had a chance to see it, please go ahead. <laughs> Um, I actually met Hannah probably in 2004 as part of the summer work circuit um, and she was just one of those people who um, honestly just watching her tra trajectory over the last 10-15 uh, years has been quite amazing just in terms of her work ethic and the, the kinds of, t of relationships that she ta tackles in her work. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to watch her and to uh, see her work as well. Um, she's also written plays, her plays include East of Berlin, This is War, The Little One, Other People's Children, The, Children of, uh, the Children's Republic, and um, the first play I saw was the Russian play, which was <laughs> quite fun. Um, and she's uh, been produced across the country, coast to coast in the United States, Britain and Japan, and it, even in Australia. <coughs> Um, and this year, she also was one of nine winners to win uh, Yale University's Wyndham uh, Campbell Prize for Literary Achievement. So, Hannah, everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Anushree Roy is uh, currently in this season as, a play as an actor, but she's also a playwright in her own right. Um, Anushree was a student at York University when I was working at Playwrights Guild, and she came to attend a workshop session that we produced called Emerge. So it was essentially a session of a series of workshops that were enabling emerging artists to self-produce and how to network and how to kind of just get started in the professional realm. Um, so what, just to, to watch her become a student, from being a student, to become a professional artist has been quite amazing in itself. Um, I believe her first year of producing, was it P Piazza? Yeah, Piazza. Yeah, Piazza. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she kind of just swept the Dora Awards. She was just <laughs> like um, everywhere. So um, I'd like to introduce Anusri. <laughs> and this, uh, this season's um, playwright for, or last season's playwright for The Last Wife, Kate Hennig, is also a performer in Breath of Kings this year. And her play, um, The Virgin Trial, will be produced next year, which is, I believe, the second in a trilogy of plays? We'll <laughs> <laughs> have to find out. Um, <laughs> and Kate is actually the, the, the only playwright on this panel who I'm, I've actually just met. Um, so I'm not as familiar with her work, but from what I've read so far, she, she tackles quite um, interesting 
uh, an interesting perspective of history and a women's perspective of history through the stories that she writes. And I'd like to introduce Kate. So uh, just to let you know, we're, we have um, ushers in the theater and they will be handing out pencils and paper. If you have questions, please feel free to flag down an usher and um, we'll be collecting questions throughout. Um, I do have a set series of questions, but I would like to intersperse the, the questions that you have so that this can become a, a dialogue between all of us here. Um, so just to start, I'm just going to go down the line. If each of you can just tell me a little bit about what brought you to theater and when you first started writing for theater. So I'm just going to set the template for everyone else, right? That's <laughs> no problem. Um, well, I, uh, uh, I went to the National Theatre School of Canada as an actor, and I was um, a very crappy actor. <laughs> and I, I was on probation the entire time. I was at the National Theatre School until they worked out that I loved the playwriting classes and that I um, spent like all my spare time writing plays and then stuffing them under the door of the playwriting teachers. Um, and so in my, at the end of my second year, uh, they invited me to quit the acting program <laughs> and join the playwriting program. And they gave me a month to think about it and I was so offended. Uh, <laughs> And I categorically refused. I said, graduate me in acting or not at all. <laughs> and uh, of course, they were right and prescient. And uh, I left theater school, and I never acted again. <laughs> but I wrote plays. Uh, yeah. So that's the beginning of my journey, really. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I think each of you have a very different um, <coughs> story. So if we can That's continue. amazing. <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, I, on the other hand, <laughs> had a the, um, different track with acting. So I've been acting since I was five and kind of writing. I've always written, but nothing in, in the way as seriously as I did my acting work. Um, when I went, I, I'm an immigrant. I came to Canada when I was 17 years old with my family. And I went, all I ever wanted to do was be an actor. So I went to York University and I said to them at the audition panel, I'm going to graduate here as an actor because they only pick 16 people the second year that you uh, are there. So I did the first year, and then second year went for the auditions. And I knew in my soul that I would, of course, be one of the 16 people. I came from India. Like, I worked on my accent. You have to take me. <laughs> and of course, they didn't. Uh, and then they said, nope, sorry, can't, nope, nope. And then I bawled and cried, and I said to my mom, you know what, I want to go to National Theater School because they're the country's best. And my beloved mother said, uh, she's live stream watching this, I think, so I better be careful. Uh, my, my mom said, uh, uh, it has the word school in it. We didn't immigrate you to this country to go somewhere with the word school, so no. <laughs> this is so unfair. Are you kidding? And she said, well, question doesn't arise. You have to work hard so they teach your work. Until then, you're not going anywhere. So I thought, oh my god. So I went into this playwriting class um, at York with Judith Rudukoff, who was the professor there. And I started writing, because I've always written. Like, it's something that I, it, it's not that I didn't ever do it, but it wasn't anything formal. But studying structure with her, studying the histories with her, studying classics with her. And she was the first person that one day pulled me aside and said, you have a voice and don't change it. Like, don't change the way you write. Just grow on it. So I graduated and I decided to do a master's. So I went to U of T to do a master's. And then I met fellow creators there and formed a company and then started working. So, uh, you know, kind of the trajectory went that way. And two years ago, NTS called to say they're teaching one of my plays. So I called my mom and I said, OK, I'm going to go now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to Montreal and I was like, mother, it happened. So that's how I, my story went about. Um, so I had, I had been working in the theatre for 20 years already uh, uh, when I went to write a master's degree in England uh, and I, uh, like Anushri, uh, had, had been writing, you know, kind of always. And then, um, but not plays, but not plays. And so I, I had to write a dissertation and 
I was introduced to an extremely rigid form. And I was trying to um, uh, put the incredibly esoteric work that I was doing as a voice, um, uh, an explorer of voice studies into this extremely rigid form. Um, and it was kind of like putting a puzzle together. And I, after my initial rebellion against it, I, I found myself really enjoying it. Um, and, and I did a play called The Danish Play, uh, which is written by Sonia Mills, and was introduced to the Nightwood Theater. And Kelly Thornton suggested that I write a play. And I was like, well, I don't know how to write a play. And she said, yes, you do. You've been working in this business for 25 years. Go on, write a play. So I wrote a play. And that was the beginning of uh, the end. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so for each of you, are there any kind of driving um, themes or ideas that you, you want to tackle with each of, your, each of your pieces? Or is there like an overall thing that you, um, you feel that you need to say? Or how do you approach a new play? <laughs> Over here? I don't, think, I don't think there's a very specific kind of, you know, uh, thing that I go, I want to tackle this thing. Usually my play finds me. What I have to do comes to me. Uh, whether a producer approaches with something that they're interested in, in or in conversation, I realize my soul needs for me to write this story. And then I write it, and God has been very kind to me. It has ended up with a producer or someone's interested. Mm -hmm. But I've never gone, seeked out, I should write a play about da-da-da. You know, I, I always feel it's been provided. The characters come, the writing has come, and I have been a vessel, and I truly mean it. Like, it sounds, you know flaky in a way, but, but I mean it, like you, you become the vessel with which you're, you, it, it's going through you to what the product needs to be, you know, versus generating the product in yourself. That mm -hmm. has been my track. Yeah, I'm similar to that in a way. I think there are those playwrights who mastermind and they really have a sense um, ahead of time of exactly what the play will be and they write it down. <laughs> I don't write that way, I write emergent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which means like 90% of what I write I throw out yes. and I do endless iterations to try and find the story. I write to find it, um, which is a much longer process. Um, and so I often, I mean, I, I, can, I can tell you after the fact some of the things that I know to be true about my writing, mostly because other people have told me over time. <laughs> um, but it isn't, you know, I know that I listen for character. Um, you know, but I know, you know, from having it repeated to me enough times that I have a, you know, I tend to sort of teeter my plays on the edge of um, somewhere, you know, between tragedy and comedy, that there's a lot of dark humor in them. You know, I know that I'm really always after morality and I'm interested in questions of morality. Um, <laughs> so I, so I, and I know I like to go through the lens of the personal to get to the political. But I think as a writer, I mostly, I really, really listen for character is the essential thing about my writing. Um, but I really wish I was one of those playwrights who could I know, just. No, me too. Who could be like, I write, <laughs> I know. Like John Mighton, who is like, I write about science. And I thought, so satisfying. I wish I could say that. Oh. And that you kind of go into it knowing. Like, I remember a moment in my play, Brothel Number no. 9, where I'm typing one morning at 2 in the morning, and, and suddenly the character's saying, I, you know, I, I, she had done an act of violence like years ago. And as I'm typing, I'm going, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And I start crying, going, oh my god, she did this? What is she doing? And, I, and later, I thought, what does that even mean? I wrote it. Like, how do I not know? I know. But I don't. I really don't. There's no, I swear I don't. I don't. I and don't I, I go through say. phases where I think, I really don't like this part. And then I think, I, I wrote. I wrote yes. it. Yes. Like, I can change the change. part I don't like. I, 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 I agree totally. I think that, that the, the, the idea of playwright as vessel mm -hmm. is, is really accurate. I think that um, 
uh, plays move through individual artists in the same way that acting moves through individual artists. If if a if a playwright was given an assignment and 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 uh, you know to to write a specific thing, um, even even though the specifics were granted on a piece of paper, each artist would have their own version of how that story was going to come through them. And it's the same with acting. There's, uh, you know, I always say to my acting students, um, pick up the best things that you can from the people who have done the scene before you, because when it moves through your body, it will be something entirely different. Um, so in a way, I think that, that the, the sort of old adage of, of mimicry or um, being the finest form of flattery is, is absolutely accurate, that uh, um, there, there's no way that two, two artists can write the same story, mm -hmm. even if the parameters are mm -hmm. given to you specifically. <laughs> Thank I'd you. like to try. <laughs> It'd be fun to try and write a play by Anusri Roy. <laughs> Can I write one of yours? Can I write my favorite, the little one? Can I write it? Yeah. Um, so let's jump into the idea uh, or the relationship between the dramaturg and the writer. So um, have you worked with the same dramaturg for each play, or is there a specific um, kind of, are you assigned a dramaturg when you um, are assigned, a, uh, when you're working with a different theater company, or what's that relationship? What's the basis of that relationship? What do you need from that person? Um, does it change from play to play? You guys all know what a dramaturg is? No. Oh. So let's start there. <laughs> OK. So um, a dramaturg, I describe a dramaturg as someone who can either be an editor or a research, someone who helps you with research, and really just somebody who asks you very solid, good questions so that you can go back to your play and ex expunge all of the stuff that's in there and kind of just mine all of the ideas. Um, they tell you if things are working, if things are not working. Um, or just ask you valid questions so that you can question yourself and help the process along. Um, some people, some companies will hire dramaturgs to strictly do the historical research on a play. Um, other, uh, other processes include the director dramaturg where they get it up on its feet and they workshop the play um, and bring in actors and run exercises to explore different um, relationships. So uh, it really just depends on the process that the theater company is placed on the, on the production or if it's a workshop um, or if it's like going into production or where it is in the, where the play is in its development. So I think of a, a dramaturg as a coach, like someone who, who coaches, like a, you know, we're, we're watching the Olympics right now and we see, uh, I'm watching weightlifting because I love weightlifting. Um, <laughs> And I see one, uh, one athlete on the platform, and I see two, three, or four people standing in the wings going, <laughs> you know? So to me, I, I think of, uh, of the people who support the process of writing as those coaches standing in the wings. And I've had amazing relationships, uh, uh, primarily with uh, Andy McKim, who is the artistic director at Theatre Passamurai, and uh, with Bob White. Is Bob here? Bob? No. Uh, who is the director of New Place here at Stratford. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think mostly my relationship has been with um, production dramaturgy. So, you know, I'll work with the director on the script so that there's a collaboration between us and I'm able to start to um, fit the play to the production, um, which is my preferred way of working. I like, I like collaborations with directors that are true collaborations. You know, sometimes when directors say they want to collaborate with you, they mean they want to tell you what to do. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, that's actually very rarely been the case with me. I've, I've had really good <laughs> relationships with directors. I've been super lucky that way. And, um, and yeah, you know, the dramaturg is there to talk to you about what your play means, and then you get to decide if you think that that's what you want it to mean. <laughs> um, uh, so that's the, the, the role that is most useful to me. Okay. Yeah, especially because in my plays, I spend a lot of time constructing ambiguities. And when you're trying to create clarity, um, 
that's simpler. But if you're trying to create an ambiguity, what you're trying to do is have two possibilities or more open up in the mind of the audience. And that's just a bit trickier to construct. And you can easily fall into just total incomprehension. And that's what you're trying not to do. You want two ideas to open up in the minds of the audience, not nothing at all. Um, so that's like a particularly tricky thing. And I, so I am particularly needy, I think, in terms of having uh, dramaturgs work with me. And Bob White's been working with me and watching me roll around on the ground and cry and thrash. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> He's standing in the wings. <laughs> and, and of course, Sarah Stanley and I, Sarah's sitting right there. Uh, we've been collaborating very closely on Bunny for like three months. I can't imagine how sick of me she must be. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have a um, mind relationship uh, with dramaturgs are usually always uh, very heavy when it comes to the script work, but not so much when it comes to in production. I rarely... Let me rephrase that. I have a couple of shows coming. I, I, I do very little rewrites as far as the plays I've done when it's in production because my brain just needs it to be a finished product. So I'm not, I never show up with like fully rewritten scene, restructured scene. I don't do that. I'll change lines of actors needs it, cuts, movement, here, there. But, it's, but I do it all in the front end because I am very controlling. Uh, of, uh, I, so I get nervous that it won't work because I'm stressing out an actor, or because I'm an because I'm an actor. I hate when writers come in with <laughs> new pages five days before opening. I'm like, you really want me to learn this? So, <laughs> so because I don't because that experience really makes me nervous. So I never do that. So I always go. This is a very final product of the production draft, and when we go into rehearsal, I go, I'll change anything you need to serve it. But I can't like. Anyway, so my dramaturgy relationships, one of my primary dramaturgs, one of my best friends, Iris Charcot, who has, you know, you know, she has served my plays in the most beautiful way possible. Um, but I work individually with every theater company, you know, they have their own dramaturgs, so you kind of have to go with the rhythm of it. But Iris has secretly read all of the plays <laughs> and given me notes. I've been like, read this, is it working? But you always need somebody, at least for me, who, who can tell you the absolute truth. Like, if it is absolute crap, you need to rewrite from page one. I've had that conversation, and it's horrifying, and you're rolling on the ground crying. But you'd rather that than, than sitting in the audience when your show is opening, and you go, oh my god, what have I done? You know, it's the worst feeling. You know? So you'd rather take it in the front end, right? Oh, wait, there's nothing worse than sitting in an audience and knowing that you bored the sh <laughs> stuff. 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 <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> no need we to were finish. Told, that we was were an ellipsis. <laughs> I think, was it an ellipsis or a, a long dog? A cut off. Yeah, yeah. Cut off. <laughs> So, um, Playwriting humor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my ribs, my ribs. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about the, the word and the um, importance of who controls the word and how we tell stories? Um, so earlier this week, I, I asked for a little bit of feedback in terms of um, questions that they wanted to field <clears throat> and ideas about um, playwriting in contemporary playwriting. And um, Kate, you brought up the, the, the question about the form of playwriting. And, and if we could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, so um, it, it, when I start to sort of theorize about storytelling in general, um, and, and this was provoked, I think, in me by actually sitting down and trying to write stories, um, and, and particularly writing stories uh, from what Bob White calls the female gaze. I don't know if everyone uses that term, but anyway, the female gaze. Um, <clears throat> so I, I asked myself, well, uh, is there any feminine storytelling? Storytelling, um, I think the first stories were written down um, sort of around Homer's time. And, and, and so that the stories that were written down were all stories of men by men. And the stories of women were then somehow <coughs> kept secret or certainly kept uh, 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 the, 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 the transfer of those stories was done orally. 
Um, so I guess one of my, my big questions is, do we even know what feminine, and I don't mean female, I mean feminine, storytelling is? So, and it, are plays, in their essence, a masculine construct, and I do not mean a male construct, I mean a masculine construct. So one that is finite, one that moves from here to there, one that has structure and form. Is that the only way that plays literary plays function? So that, that's a question that I grapple with mm -hmm. uh, in, in my own work. <coughs> so am I, am I basically just a force for the masculine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a question. Yeah. So when we're talking about new uh, ways of creating now, so uh, collective creations or um, writing traditions that come from other cultures, um, can we incorporate those into how we move forward in our own writing or, um, yeah. Uh, That's my question, I guess, is yeah. I I inclusivity, is inclusivity part of uh, what a feminine construct might be in terms of, 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 um, uh, of play writing? Uh, uh, so, um, it, yeah, and, and, and how does that manifest in terms of what I love, which is structure, form, and uh, and the word, like the importance of language. So I find myself in a, in a feminist, masculinist quandary mm -hmm. there, I, I guess. Do either of you two want to comment on that? or? I mean, I think I make the assumption that my plays include feminine dramaturgy because I wrote them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say, you know, on the collective front, um, and I know, you know, w within theater right now, it's very, we spend a lot of time thinking about um, experimenting in terms of how many writers, like in terms of collective creation, right? Like, so there's a lot of um, experimentation within theater in which we go away from the text and we go to image and we go to a number of different writers. But then, you know, I think because I travel between mediums so much and I write in television and film, like honestly in TV, it's collective creation. Yeah, right. Time. Right? And so, I, you know, and that's a particularly masculine environment. Right. Like mm. TV writing, it's something like 16% women. I'm always the only one woman in the room, more or less, in TV, and we're collectively creating. So I never really think about, like, we're all just like yelling our ideas over each other, <laughs> right? Literally. So I, I, literally. So I, I never think like, oh, collective creation is particularly feminine because my one experience of collective creation is television writing, right. where I am mm -hmm. the woman in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, often, that's not always the case, but it's often it's often the case that I, you know, yeah. So, okay. so yeah. So I, I guess yeah. My association with collective creating is masculine. I have a question. <laughs> do Do you guys ever fear that um, that plays that uh, are are based on language and form uh, will become extinct? Oh God, I hope not. Yeah, like, no, but, but, but here we sit as, as playwrights, right? And so I just wonder is, as, as the theater moves forward and, uh, and you, you know, like there's, there's a whole, there's a sort of trend towards verbatim theater mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and, and um, uh, visual, like really strong visual technical theater, more dance forms in the theater, all that kind of stuff. Like, Do you know why I think it won't? Is because ultimately, it always, always, whether it's theater, what, whatever, it, 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 whether it's musical, whether it's text-based theater, whether it's uh, collective creation work, it boils down to just that one thing, which is story. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's all people are coming to see is a story that will either change them, transform them, or whatever else when you watch a TV show. You, you're attracted to the story. So I do feel that stri strictly text-based theater, I really don't, I mean, it's existed this long in, in different cultures and in different practices, I don't think will die because our need as audiences to come and be a part of a story that will change us or where we can identify ourselves, that drive will not change because it is so human and at the base level of who we are. So we will want that. 
I believe, as, as a commodity to take. In, 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 in that sense, and as writers to write, because we're so attracted to, that's ultimately what we're doing, is telling a story, whatever, whatever it is, I think. And I wonder if that shift towards the visual and spectacle um, is more a reflection of where we are as a culture and our art <coughs> being a mirror to what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So depending on where we move from here, mm -hmm. it might shift in, in respect to that as well. So if we do um, you know, have a completely virtual reality in the next 10, 15 years, um, even though story is the base of it, it might actually, like th it is a valid question, there might be a shift away from the written word or more online or more recordings or, yeah, it could, it could shift. Interesting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm going to, I'm just going to change the uh, perspective a little bit. Um, we received an email from PGC and the, um, the Equity in Theatre Initiative, and we're uh, working with them just to kind of uh, get an idea of what the landscape of playwriting and the production of female writers' plays um, is like in Canada. So one of the stats that was given to us was that at Playwrights Guild of Canada, over 50% of their members are female, yet one quarter of the productions um, that happen annually are written by female playwrights. Um, and the idea is that we were told that women don't submit their plays. So, th so that's, the, that's the information. So I just wanted to discuss that a little bit. I don't. Like to producers, you mean? To producers and to uh, possible, yeah, possible producers. Yeah. I don't. You don't. Just to be clear. And why is that? And why is that? Um, I think I'm, I'm, I think there are two reasons. Temperamentally, I am not well suited to pushing my own work, um, so I don't do it. Mm -hmm. And also, I like to spend that time uh, writing new plays rather than um, submitting my work. Um, the other reason is that we do, we do sort of know from, I mean, my parents are social scientists, so you'll hear me talk about evidence, but the, um, uh, we do know from sort of study after study that while men are rewarded for um, pushing their work and being assertive, women tend to be penalized. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually might work against me, career-wise, to push my work. Um, so what I do do is I have four young women uh, whose work that I really believe in, and I advocate for their work. So I have four of them, and it, it's a, an informal relationship in a way, um, but I, I do it consistently, and I have for years with these particular four young women. So I'll call up artistic directors, and I'll say, I don't know if you've heard about uh, this young woman's work, but I would really like you to look at it for this award or this unit or um, for production. And that's been fairly successful. Um, and because I, I, I do find it much easier to advocate for other people than myself that's at this fantastic. point. Yeah. Yeah, it's, mentorship is such an in integral part of this community in terms of theater, just putting things forward and making space for other people. It makes a huge difference, I think. But I wanted to just yeah. say, like, very clearly, I am one of those women who do not submit my work, mm -hmm. just so you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anu, do you? I do. I have an agent, too, who does submit my work. I do, because, you know, uh, for me, my lens is, is, is of an Im immigrant lens, and whether I'm a Canadian citizen or not, that will not change. So I have this, when I first started here, I realized very, very quickly that if I wasn't hustling, no one was doing it for me. You know, if I, if I, when I did my master's that year in 2006, um, I went to the post office, with a stack of manila envelopes, and I don't remember how many envelopes, but I remember how much money I paid, because I had so little money. I paid $86 in postage to mail my plays to every producer in Canada, and I got uh, a f about 75% I didn't hear back. The rest, I uh, got beautiful rejection letters, truly, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic. Like some people really took the time to say, why they couldn't do it, and really well-written, beautiful, thoughtful 
considered rejection letters, and I got one email out of $86 that I couldn't even afford at that time. One email saying, really love your work, call me, want to speak with you. And it was the dramaturg at the time at Canadian Stage, who is Iris Turcotte, who happens to do a lot of my dramaturgy now. But I do, because I, I, I have found that I have to hustle my work. Otherwise, it doesn't, for to, the universe fortuitously will take care of it as much as I am hustling. You know, otherwise, it doesn't, it's not, it's, it's not noticed in the way when I was younger. And I, and, I, and I just learned that as a product of somebody who's an immigrant, as a product of somebody whose work is um, extremely political, uh, it, you know, and I, and I still hustle. And it doesn't, it doesn't make that easier. But yeah, I definitely do submit. And my agent does it more than I do now. Kate, do you submit your work? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, in terms of the, <laughs> so in terms of that figure that they're not seeing work from women, do you guys have any advice for female playwrights? Submit your work. <laughs> <laughs> don't submit your work. No. <laughs> no. I mean, mentor others. Yeah. Right. Come to me. <laughs> yeah. There's like a hundred different ways you know like i really think so like you have mm -hmm. to do the, the thing that works for you but ultimately if you want the one of the best things i learned when i was 24 was finished plays get opening nights that's it you can't have an idea that's getting an opening night it's not going to happen a dream doesn't get an opening night so if you're writing and if you either do it the kate and my route which is submit or do it hannah's route which is find an advocate a mentor that will submit for you or help you you have to do whatever you need to, to do, do work. you know, in order for somebody to read your work. It's really a, as simple as that. At know. the same time, um, Neil Monroe um, was one of the early advocates of my writing, which I'm so amazingly grateful for. Um, and Neil said to me, you, you know, once I had a finished play, mm -hmm. uh, he said, the play is there, the play is good, you need someone to take a chance on you, and that's always the way it is. You need someone who will take a chance. Now, whether that's yourself mm -hmm. and your own sort of self-producing model, which happens all the time, or whether it's a, a producing company, someone has to take the chance and actually put your play on the stage. Because if that never happens, then uh, you're, you're, you just won't advance as, as a playwriting artist. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So there's a stigma around women's writing that it's somehow not universal um, in, in uh, the same way that men's wor work is universal and instead women's plays are considered personal and individual. Um, when you guys receive rejection or commentary about your play, do you ever think that it's based on your gender? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think it... I think that I don't know, right? Like, because it's very difficult to know yeah. exactly why, and so you don't know. But I will say that my plays with male protagonists do get produced more often. Mm. And that could be because they're better, and it could be because they're more producible, whatever that means, and it could be that people are sexist. <laughs> And I, I cannot tell you which it is, right? Because I can't, I don't know. I can't look into people's hearts and minds and say, this is this is why, um, you know, my my plays with male protagonists are produced more often. But I do know that it's true, you know. Um, yeah, I think that's the answer to the question you're asking. I mean, in terms of women's work being universal, oh, that's such a brutal. Brutal question. I mean, and I think, you know, I was sort of talking backstage to you all mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. a phenomenon of um, op-eds being written about my work <laughs> in which usually a young man uh, talks about the fact that, you know, I don't go after the big ideas. Like, I don't go after metaphysics or being. Um, you know, I just go after politics and history and sexuality. <laughs> You know, and there's an assumption that, you know, because, because I'm just a girl and I haven't read my Heidegger and my Wittgenstein, and for all those young men, if you're listening out there, I've fucking read my Wittgenstein. <laughs> 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 
I just don't want to write about it. I want to write about what I'm writing about. So, mm -hmm. fuck all y'all. <laughs> she got two in. <laughs> two swears, right? Yeah. I was allowed two. Okay. <laughs> I think three actually. You have one. You have one. Can I use one word? <laughs> yeah, go. No, my mom's watching. Uh, <laughs> No, you know, it's, it's the thing. My criticism always comes from men of color who will call the theater and who will say, I want to speak to the writer. And thank God the theater will say, no, you will not. And then, then, then it proceeds to who the hell does she think she is talking about this on stage and I spit on your faces, it was one of the phone calls, for producing her work. Your theater will not go any. Excuse me, your theater will not go anywhere because you're giving this woman of color the platform to talk about things she thinks is important because it's not. When my play Brothel Number no. Nine uh, got done at Factory Theater, uh, uh, you know, it's a play about sex trade. I spent a ton of time with sex workers in India and did my research to the T because I never wanted to be irresponsible. Academic research and, and, and also in field research. And uh, a, a, a woman, uh, 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 I'm a Hindu, and I, wrote, and I write religion very, very much predominantly comes across in my plays. I'm a practicing Hindu. And in the show, in the play, there's a Muslim person, a Hindu person, and it's a complicated relationship within a sex trade industry. Um, Hindu people have sex, Muslim people have sex. Hindu people are sex workers and pimps, as are Muslims. And I got a phone call at the theater, and this gentleman called and said, um, why is the... A uh, police officer who has sex with the sex tra trade workers, Muslim, to the producer. And the people at Factory are like, that's what the writer wrote. It's her imagination. We don't know. And then on the other side, the guy said, well, her imagination is wrong. So <laughs> tell her it's wrong. And I need to talk to her. But they wouldn't let us connect because they were so stressed that like he would set me on fire. I don't know, like something would happen. So, but I, I said, can I have his number? Like, I'll call him. But they didn't. The dramaturg fielded all the phone calls. They just did not, you know. But, but oftentimes, or, or in papers, or in, at temples, when I meet people, the criticism always is, you know, you need to tone it down. It's a bit, it's a lot. You're right, you're young. You'll never find a husband. You need to tone it down. <laughs> it's true. So the guy I'm with now, I'm like, okay, found one. But, but you know, it's always that way at the temple. 34, you're still oh single. Oh my goodness. This is why. It's like the opposite in my community because every time I do a play, I get a couple of letters from Jewish mothers who are like, you've got to meet my son. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? He's a heart surgeon. I'm like. <laughs> I'm gonna put my name on your plays and yeah, you put your name on. Yeah, we're gonna switch, we're gonna switch. Well, there's, there's an interesting conversation. Um, plays that you write now versus what you wrote 10 years ago, do you feel more emboldened to write about different things or um, do you feel that your plays are received differently now? I would rewrite things I wrote 10 years ago. Let me just say that. Uh, uh, no, you know, I think, I think uh, they're received differently in the sense that I've grown as a writer, for sure. So it's when I see somebody do something I did 10 years ago, I sometimes cringe going, why did I put that scene in? Or, oh my God, I should have written that better. But, but I think it, it speaks to who I was as an artist then. And if it, the story is good, uh, it'll stand the test of whenever it's done. You know, if the, if the story makes sense and then moves the audiences as it did then, will it now? But often I, I do kind of secretly want to go in and rewrite things a little bit for me. Yeah. How about in terms of society's sensibility towards um, issues of the other? Do you, do you feel that your work is received differently because people are more willing to listen to other people's experiences as opposed to pushing the same generic experience? Uh, well, I think as I you know, move along as a playwright, I get bolder for sure. You know, I think like Bunny, the play that's up at this festival, is certainly like uh, the blushiest play I've written, you know? <laughs> Uh huh. Um, <laughs> I'm writing about you know sexual desire and sexual shame. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So that's a that's a lot to take on. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I think you know when I I look I look ahead to some of my projects that are upcoming. I definitely see that um, 
I'm pushing further. Like I have a project that's sort of about modern maternity, and so that there, there, um, you know, I, we're writing about miscarriage, for instance, which isn't something that really gets talked about much, and we're we're writing about it pretty openly, and we're writing about it from a, a confessional um, point of view. So I think that'll be. I'm really interested to see how an audience will respond to our project about modern maternity. Um, you know, and it's funny because I'm I'm going to admit to a great deal of things within this play mm -hmm. that I'm working on, and I'm like looking at you all now, and I'm about I was about to sort of say, oh, it's about this, and then I found that hard. I was like, oh yeah, I'm really going to talk about my own miscarriage in a in a project, and that's a, like a late term miscarriage, and so. <laughs> So we'll see, but I mean, there you go. I'm, I'm being, I'm getting bolder. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. <laughs> um, in terms of the role of, and this is just going back to just being a person. In terms of the role of females in life, just in terms of maternity, having kids, elder care, things happening with the family. I know for myself, a lot shifted when my father had a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, pers perspectives on things changed, priorities changed. All of a sudden, I was rooted in Toronto because I needed to be close mm -hmm. to my family. Mm -hmm. um, so can you guys talk a little bit about, um, as a playwright, do you find that um, those sorts of things affect how you, do you expect that those sorts of things affect how you approach a project versus how you think it would uh, <laughs> affect a man in the same situation? Like in terms of like, Having a new baby, how did that affect your writing? I have a new baby. <laughs> I have a one-year-old named Elijah. And I'll say this, so, uh, um, uh, I mean, for sh so it's, I'm a zombie, this process, which is extraordinary. Like, my baby gets up in the night a lot um, still. And uh, I was thinking, actually, about the flight here from Halifax to Stratford. And I, I did it with, by myself with my young son. And I felt like I was doing so well, too. Like, I was keeping him <laughs> occupied. Um, and then uh, I was feeding him, like, a little container of puffs. And uh, I, he was going to tip them over. So I thought, oh, you know, I'll just put them behind my back. So I thought I'd put the cover on it. And I put it behind my back. And they all went down my pants. <laughs> <coughs> And they were like stuck to my butt and my legs. You have one more, you have my butt and my legs. And uh, they were like coming out the bottom of my pants. And I was like, and then the next day was the first day of rehearsal for Bunny. And I like looked down at my ankle and there was a puff stuck to my ankle. And I was like, this is totally new. Like, this is not what I, this is new. Yeah. So. Oh my god. That's my story about motherhood and being a playwright. But how about your responsibilities to your family? Like, do you, do you find, um, because it's, I know you're close to your parents as well. Yeah, I'm really close to my parents. You know, it's, it, 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 it does. It changes you. Life circumstances changes you because you have to change. You can't, you can't, and your writing adapts to it. You know, a couple of, I turned 30 a couple of years ago, and on my 30th birthday, I woke up, and the lower half of my body just wasn't working. Like, I couldn't get out. Like, I sat on be in bed, but I wasn't able to just move my legs. And I got diagnosed with spinal arthritis and arthritis in my left eye that day. And your life changes. Suddenly you have to take, give yourself injections in just to walk. So I walk only because I give myself these injections and take oral medication. But your dreams change, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I, I was getting produced. I was touring at the time. I had a solo show touring. I was, all tours got canceled. All the, and everything changes, the lens changes, because I have to always be aware that I don't have an attack coming or that my injections, I have enough injections to get me through this crazy show that I'm in or that your body changes and deadlines because n the play still has to get done, right? The, the, the opening night date is not gonna change, but my drafts are due, you know? So it, it all changes, it's, it's a big juggle and it's a, it's a lot of, it's just, honestly, like it's just a lot of work, but you have to make it, work if you want to keep working in the business and not have a second job. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, 
in order for me to support myself as a writer, pay my bills, and, and act, but not get a side job, you just got to do that hustle and have enough plays in production. So I have four shows premiering this fall in a variety of different categories. But that took so much legwork to get here, you know, and manage a health thing that's very chronic for me. Like, can I see through my left eye today, or can I, everything is blurry or no? Like, it's just so much managing, you know. But I did find that Indian brown boy uh, that everybody <laughs> told I couldn't. So it does, it does make it easier when you have a, a partner that's caring, compassionate, and picks up the slack and likes doing laundry. <laughs> So it does help, you know. So that's that's the juggle, but it's definitely a definitely a juggle, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Moving yeah. on. So um, we've got some questions from the audience. I'm just gonna um, pick the first one. Um, as a new playwright, how do you build your confidence to submit, and where do you find your mentors? That's a good question. Uh, where do you find your, where did I find my mentors? Um, I, I submitted, like I didn't think that I didn't have the confidence to submit, so I, I'm not sure I can speak to that, so I just submitted to everybody. What ends up happening is that one person that picks you or the three, two people that decide that they're going to coach you, you end up having long-term relationships with them, and then you end up finding out who the other dramaturgs in the business are, and you just call them and go, I'm a new writer, my name is Anushi Roy, and I've written one play. Can I please take you out for coffee? And seriously, people are so kind. Yeah. They will see you. Like, and sometimes I've had people going, I'm extremely busy, call me in six months. And then I call them in six months, and they go, I'm still busy, call me in two more months. But they do see you, you know, and, they, and they'll take you out for that coffee, and they'll talk you through the business. And so now we get to do that now, because where we take people out and take them out for coffee, because people did it for us. But you, Producers do see you, so for me, you pick up the phone call. You pick up the phone and you just call people um, and make that happen if you want as a young writer. I don't know what was it. That's you? really good advice, honestly. There are lots yeah. of uh, of playwriting units as well, and I think one of the best ways for young writers to uh, um, to sort of progress their work is in even just playwriting circles, which can be created mm -hmm. by. Uh, any ad hoc group of artists. And so just people getting together and reading something that they've written that week uh, for other writers who have also written something that week. And one week you'll read, and one week you'll read somebody else's work, and so on. And, and, and that kind of support um, and, and, the, and the boldness to speak your words out loud for the first time in front of people. Uh, is the fear of that cannot be uh, um, like, like it? The first time a play of mine was read in public, I I literally was shaking through the whole thing. It's it, 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 it's a fear that I haven't felt. I don't think I've ever felt as an actor uh, that much fear. So it was it was it was a profound amount of fear so so to be able to start to lessen that anxiety i think is really important and then that gives you the confidence to submit or to say yes my work is actually powerful i've had enough feedback within a group of my peers to know that i i am at that level yeah okay um, for hana in Bunny, you express a point of view on the conflicting impulses of self-realization and guilt. At what stage of your life did you arrive at the resolution um, of that conflict that you express in the play? Oh, God. <laughs> well, thank you for seeing it, whoever. <laughs> and that's, that's awesome. Um, uh, at what point? I mean, I don't think I have. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, why I'm writing about it. Why is I don't, I don't have a resolution to that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's like honestly the truth. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm completely resolved as a human being. Yeah. <laughs> totally great over here. 
Okay. <laughs> um, next question. Could each of you talk about the inspiration for one of your plays? Your Go, Hannah. Recent play. Yeah. Inspiration, I mean, uh, uh, I'm like, what have I written? <laughs> little one. What inspired little Just one? Just a second. My favorite. What, 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 what place did I write? Yeah. Uh, um, a little one. Uh, well, actually, little one is weird. Little one. Um, if it's being sold here, please buy it. It's my favorite. <laughs> it's really so nice. good. My favorite in newsfeed play. Is brothel <laughs> number nine. We're both in my favorite. Um, actually, I really like all your plays. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, little one was, is a weird one. Um, I overheard a conversation that my mother had with one of her friends while we were visiting Hong Kong, and I was 16. And my mother was talking to her friend about a child that her friend had adopted, who um, had ended up being, they had discovered that she had been horrifically sexually abused before the age of four. Mm. And that child, she had eventually had to give that child up because that child was uh, destroying their family. And uh, it was a, like a horrible dilemma in which, and, and I, I just heard, of, like I literally wasn't even supposed to hear the conversation, I overheard it. And then in my 30s, I was still thinking about it um, because it did seem to, uh, there was something in it that got my attention about morality, which is sort of often where, you know, and about what the limits of love might be. Um, and so I, I, uh, I wrote a whole play based on that <laughs> tiny little idea of like a, a young girl who was adopted into a family but ultimately had to be um, given up. I swear it's funny. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> Never describe your plays. <laughs> <laughs> Inspiration for? Uh, my play Piazza, which is a solo show, one of my first plays that got produced in this country, uh, was uh, um, when I lived back in India, I was, as I sp said, I was born and raised there. I lived in a family of um, opulence. Like I was raised in a very happy, healthy home with a lot of um, uh, resources. Uh, my father was an engineer and a CEO of a big plant. My mom was a physics professor but kind of didn't need to work, so we had a big family, lots of servants, home, house, cars, everything. And uh, we had an untouchable servant because it's still practiced in India, even though it is constitutionally abolished, untouchability is constitutionally abolished, practiced every day. Um, and we had an untouchable servant who used to come and, uh, uh, for people that don't know, uh, in the Hindu religion, um, every religion has its problems. As much as the religion is beautiful and wonderful, it also is problematic. Uh, it is, uh, you have a caste system. So it's uh, Brahman, uh, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. And these are four castes which you are categorized into. You're born into it. And then the, this one is untouchables, where no one even touches you, and you're the labor class. According to the old, old kind of mythology books, this division started so everybody had equal opportunity in society. So you would take care of the prayers and I would take care of building homes and you would take care of the trading. It was divided in that way. And then your son would do the same, your son would do the same, hence you're born into it. But as society progressed, it got dirtier and murkier and problematic. So the untouchable people are people who clean toilets. So we had an untouchable servant that cleaned our bathroom and no one spoke with him, no one talked to him. When he came, cleaned the bathroom and left, his footprints would go with him, obviously, the footprints on the thing. Another servant who was a touchable servant would come and, this is all true, would come and clean those footprints so it didn't touch ours. And that's the home I was raised in. And that's the value I knew to be true. So I practiced it in the sense that I didn't speak with him. I don't know, he did his job, I wasn't there. Like kind of that kind of an attitude because that's where I was raised in. And when we gave him food, so cup your hand, Hannah, so you would give, give him food like that and then walk away. So it, just to ensure that I accidentally don't touch it. L really, like, that was how it was. And it was fine. I moved here at 17, and my life changed. We became extremely poor because we got robbed, and I became kind of 
you know, from rags to complete riches, four people in the family, no one has jobs, 9-11 happened, we were being kicked out and beaten up and many, many other things that, you know, is, mm. it makes for a good story. But my whole life changed. We became extremely poor. And for six years, we were extremely poor. And I noticed, no, of course, because that's life, you just realize truly what it is to be on the other side and not have based just food in the fridge, you know, and have a struggling family from a father that was an engineer to a mother that was a prof to, like, <coughs> them working labor jobs or not even getting a job. So I went back home, and I met the servant, and I said to him, he was still working in my family home because my uncle lives there, and I said, I am so sorry. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no clue. I was just going by what I was doing. And I just living in poverty, now I kind of, I'm so sorry. I'm, forgive me, I'm so sorry. Here's some money for your family. Like, I don't know what else to say. I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And he looked up at me, first time we've ever made eye contact, and I've known him at that at the time for 20 years. And he said, no, I will not forgive you. And then he kept the money. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a profoundly changing moment in my life because in North America, I often find sorry is very commercial. Like, you kind of expect the person to say, it's okay, don't worry about it. But he just went, no. And I thought, oh, right, because I went on this discovery of poverty and journey and blah, blah, figured it out, and now I'm apologizing. Doesn't mean I deserved it at all or that he has to give it to me, you know? He doesn't, and he's dead now. I never got forgiven and I because I didn't deserve it from his lens, and good for him, you know? Um, and I was say, all of this to say, Piazza, my solo show, is inspired by that. And I play four characters, because I was sharing the story in graduate school with my fellow colleague and Thomas Morgan Jones, who ended up dramaturging and directing the show. And he said, there's a play there. There's a play there. So I wrote about an untouchable uh, girl and her journey and um, the world through her lens, you know, what, 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 what it really happens. She's 11 years old. Um, yeah, so that was the inspiration for one of my shows. I wrote a play, uh, actually the same, same time that uh, Russian, Russian play was on uh, at Summerworks. Yeah. Um, I had a play on at Summerworks called The Eleventh David. And uh, uh, when I was uh, again at graduate school in, in um, England, I saw a Japanese company do a Yukio Mishima play uh, called Ono no Komachi. And, um, oh no, Sotobo Kamachi, sorry. Sotobo Kamachi, and it's based on a Japanese poetess from the ninth century called Ono no Komachi. And uh, there's a le there was a legend that developed about her um, uh, and, and a curse uh, from the gods. And anyway, this Sotobo Kamachi, uh, in Japanese, I saw it, 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 it was such an Unbelievable production. I'm sitting on my the edge of my seat like this, watching this whole play in Japanese. And this Japanese woman, at, uh, um, after the play was over, said to me, "Do you understand Japanese?" And I, I said, "No, not at all." And she said, "But you liked that." She could she could tell. I was like, I, I was completely entranced by it. So I came back to Canada and I and I read the English translation of Soto Bokamachi, and I was like. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't like it very much. <laughs> um, but because the Mishima estate is still extremely powerful, um, I was. I, I knew that I, I wasn't going to get the rights to do another translation, and I. I didn't really want to. So I went back to the uh, original material that Soto Bokamachi was based on, uh, which is two no plays. Um, uh, uh, by Ziami and his son, um, uh, I can't remember the name right now. Anyway, uh, these two no plays that were written about Ono no Komachi in the um, 11th century. And, and so I looked at that, those two plays, and, and then I created a contemporary play based in a little parquet in Toronto, um, where a 1,000 year old bag lady uh, sort of kept court, and a young man comes into her park. And uh, the whole idea that the gods have cursed her because she was the most beautiful woman at court, 
and she agreed to marry a man, uh, but she sort of tortured him into courting her for a hundred days, that he would have to come to the sea, to the capital, for a hundred days. And after a hundred days, she would marry him. And on the hundredth day, he perishes in a snowstorm trying to get to her. And so the gods curse her and say, you will walk the, you will walk the world for, the, for eternity until you can um, uh, uh, teach someone else about true love. So, so anyway, she sits in this, in this park and in comes this man, and I won't tell you the rest of what happens. But anyway, so that was the, um, the inspiration for a play that I, I wrote. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so we have time for one more question. I'm just gonna go back to the questions I had written here. Um, and it's mainly just to ask, uh, well, just to um, comment that female playwriting, female playwrights is a fairly modern contemporary phenomenon. We have a lot of references for, um, novelists, but women writing in theater is pretty new. And I just wanted you to comment on um, how it feels to quote unquote be a trailblazer, but also in terms of the kind of writing you do, are you conscious of the fact that you are at the vanguard? Or do you, <laughs> sorry, I just, saw, I just saw all the faces like, ah. <laughs> I mean, I think like trailblazing is a good, I mean, it's a good metaphor, I, know, I mean, you know, because you, you get to be original just for being yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It's great. Um, and, but you also, like, you know, get a lot of branches in your face, right? Like, both are true. Like, if you're going to trailblaze, you're going to, like, kind of, like, yeah. get a lot of branches in your face. <laughs> you know? Yes. And also, it's probably good to say... <laughs> That, yeah, like, I am aware of it. I'm aware that, uh, you know, like, it's very hard to name any dead female playwrights. Like, very hard. Um, like, I can name a few, right? There are a few that we can all think of, and... They, fit, they died young. But a lot of them died yeah. young, like Sarah Kane, who committed suicide at 29, right? So then you're like, well, <laughs> great, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, you know, um, so for sure, like, it's fascinating to be in a position where you have almost no examples. You know, there's only like one or two examples of yourself. Um, and in a way, there is like a great deal of, um, you know, wide openness to that. And it's exciting. Mm -hmm. I do feel for me, I hold on to a lot of people that are blazing side by me. Like, I mm. hold on to her, I'll hold on yeah. to like, there's a need, whenever I find one of us, because I just go, yes, yeah, yes, okay, yes. And then you kind of go, because it is true, like I don't have the access or the ability to call up uh, people and just go, can you just please read or help or talk, you know? But, but, but it's good, I mean, it's, it's gratifying. I'm always amazed that somebody produces the work that can be difficult and that can, uh, is very culturally specific and that mm -hmm. people come see it. Like really, every time it's done, I'm like, I'm glad this is getting done and no one told me to take out the rape scene. You know what I mean? Like that people can sit through that and that it matters and they'll come and say, okay, yeah, you know, like, so. But it's, when you're blazing a trail, you actually have a lot of work to do, so yeah. I think it's really, I, I, um, when the season was announced for next year here, and I was in the company of Sharon Pollock and Colleen Murphy, yes. I, I feel overwhelmed by the honor of that. Because even though those women are, at the outside, a generation older than me, um, it... I feel like there's legacy already in Canadian playwriting for women. Mm -hmm. and, and Judith Thompson, of yeah. course, being one of those as well. Um, probably our most famous uh, Canadian female playwright. But, but that it feels like now we are the second generation. And I say that, I know I'm older than you guys, but I've only been writing, you know, I think we're, we're kind of uh, compatriots in, in terms of how long we've been writing plays for the theater. Um, uh, so, yeah, just to say that 
Yes, yes, I think we're, we are new, but, but we're not that new. There, there, yeah. there were people who bla seriously blazed the trail before us, and I think I would include those three women. Um, and so I absolutely encourage you to come and see their plays next year, because uh, I think y you'll, you'll see how strong the legacy of, of female playwrights in Canada actually is. And it is really like just what you guys have said. It is probably worth it to say, you know, you do need partners in trailblazing. And um, it is, it is, I have actually in the last few days been thinking about how extraordinary it is to have my work up alongside Shakespeare and Arthur Miller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a female not bad, playwright. Not bad. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a woman playwright and I have my work up alongside them, you know, and they're really good. <laughs> So thank you to Stratford and to David and Anthony. Yeah, yeah. huge, 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 huge. Well, that is a great note to end on. Thank you very much.